Hello, board game brothers and sisters. I'm Adam Singer, and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. If you're new here, we do this every single week going over all the upcoming campaigns, so if you want to stay up to date, this is definitely the place to be. But before we get started, I do like to go over some news and announcements that I just found out about. But just like last week, I don't really have much new for you. And because of that, I did post a video last week going over some of the more recent Kickstarters I backed. And a couple of you did comment on that, asking me why I only talked about the Kickstarters and not the GameFound campaigns I backed. And the reason for that is because I forgot. Yeah. Filming that was a heat of the moment decision and I thought it'd be a fun change of pace, but I probably should have put a little bit more thought into it, but I will rectify that now because I did just film everything that I backed on GameFound recently and I will be posting up that video really, really soon here. It's probably not gonna go up the same day as this video just because I don't really have a lot of time this week, but I will try to edit it probably after the weekend and get it up on the Monday or Tuesday, so you can look forward to that. If you do want to see the games that I backed over on Kickstarter, you can go ahead and check that out if you haven't already. And I'll also post it in a pinned comment down below just to make it easy for you. And if you also want to see what I backed on GameFound, that might be up already depending on when you watch this video. But otherwise, you can subscribe down below, hit that bell icon, and you'll get notified once that goes up, as well as other videos like this one. Before we jump into the game's launching this week, I do want to give a quick mention to Alex over at Board Game Co because him and I do work together keeping track of all these upcoming campaigns. I do these videos every single week, but Alex posts one up at the start of each month, then you know of the heavy hitters for that month. So if you are interested in lists of upcoming games and you like this sort of content, you'll definitely want to check out his videos as well. And you can find a link to his channel down below and feel free to subscribe if you do like his content. Not much else to say this intro other than there aren't a whole lot of games this week, although the ones that we do have are very interesting and they did take me by surprise because there wasn't anything I was particularly interested in until I looked at them all and now there's quite a few. So there might be a couple here that you're pretty excited about, so let's check them out. And the first campaign we have launches on July 15th, but I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly because it's not exactly a board game. Instead, this one is a digital scoreboard for cribbage but they are also offering their own custom cribbage deck. If you're not familiar with cribbage, it's an excellent game where players are each dealt six cards and then you're gonna be choosing four to keep, but then the discarded cards go into a separate face down pile that are also gonna be scoring for whichever player dealt that hand. This means as the dealer, you wanna put cards in there that you think will help you later, but as the opponent, you wanna put cards in there that you think won't help the dealer. But at the start of each round, there's always going to be a card dealt from the top of the deck that's going to be contributing to both the dealer's hand and their opponent's. Players then just take turns playing a single card from their hand, adding the value of every card put in play to all the cards that are already in play without going over a total value of 31. If a player can't play a card without going over that value, then the other player scores a point and then they also have an opportunity to play any cards that they can if they're able. If either player is able to end the round on exactly 31, that's going to be scoring them two points, but then the total resets to zero and then play continues as normal until all the cards have been used. Once that happens, each player is going to be gaining a point for every card played in ascending or descending order, and then any pairs that add up to 15 is going to be granting them two points, two of a kind also grants two points, three of a kind grants six points, and then four of a kind grants 12 points. The digital scoreboard is designed with a retro feel using LEDs, which works really well for it in practice because it's going to grant you a maximum of 100 hours of gameplay. You can easily add points with just a couple clicks of the button and even correct scores if you make a mistake, and it's also going to help players keep track of which player's turn it actually is, the ability to save your score mid-games, and also to set the amount of points that you want the game to go up to, with options of 60, 90, 120, 180, and 240 for those extra long games. If you're interested to check this one out, I will have it linked in the description down below. And this next campaign is launching on the 16th from Lucky Duck Games, and this one is called The Flames of Fafnir. And it was a really tough decision deciding my pick of the week this week because I think there's quite a few games that really could earn that title. But I think I'm going to give it to this one for a particular reason. And the reason is that this game may not be the most intricately designed game, but I think the design does look really solid. More than that, I think this is just going to be a really fun game. And I think anyone can play this, which makes it really ideal for a family setting or if you're playing with people who maybe aren't into board games quite as much as the rest of us. But this one's a semi-cooperative game where players are going to be trying to protect their village from a dragon. Although I think this one would be more accurately described as a semi-competitive game because it is more competitive than it is cooperative. And I really do like how the semi-cooperative aspect comes 
comes into play because you're not just dealt a random card at the start of the game in order to be a traitor. Instead, you have to make a conscious decision at a certain point in the game and the first person that does that can then turn against everyone else and everyone is aware of this and you also get to ride the dragon. I told you it was fun. But players are all going to be playing as different characters with their own asymmetric abilities and each player is also going to be starting with an ability card as well that usually does have multiple uses. The main board is going to be broken up into three different sections with the city on one side and the dragon on the other and the dragon never moves from that position although it can move side to side and I'll come back to that in a second here but the players are all going to be playing their characters in the center of the board, moving across these different spaces, trying to protect the city by building buildings, fighting against the dragon, and going on various quests. And now you might be asking yourself, how does the dragon even damage the village if it can't move from that position and it can only move side to side? And the answer to that is, of course, by breathing fire. Because the way that this works is that the main city has a bunch of walls set up in front of it, and as soon as all of those are knocked down, the players actually lose the game. The way that the dragon breathes fire in this game is by first preparing to breathe that fire by putting some marbles into a ready position. And then once the dragon attacks, you're going to be putting all those marbles into the top of the dragon so that the dragon spits them out, knocking anything in the marbles way. On a player's turn, they have a bunch of different actions they can choose from, but they can only pick one to play. And the first one is to move a number of movement points and then collect resources from any of the tiles adjacent to them. Each of these tiles will generate a different type of resource. And whenever you pick those up, you're going to be moving up the associated track on your own personal player board. Resources are important because you're going to be spending them in order to build all sorts of walls that you'll be able to place out on the board in order to block those marbles and defend the city. The nice thing about building walls is that you do gain a bonus for placing them, and you also gain a bonus when they are knocked down. Another action you'll probably want to perform at some point is to just pray to the gods for some help, because anytime you do that, you're going to be able to move this token around on the rondelle on your board, which can grant you with all sorts of benefits, mainly the ability cards that, like I said, can be used for multiple different purposes. But scattered across the board are a bunch of different quest tokens, and each of these are going to have a couple quests outlined on the bottom of them that will require some amount of resources in order to get some sort of benefit. And there's going to be an easy quest and a hard quest on each of these. And in order to complete that quest, all you got to do is move your character onto that token and then perform the quest action, which will allow you to look at that token and then complete it if you are able to do so. But the main reason you're probably going to want these tokens is because each one does have an icon of a certain type of rune on top of the token, so these are always visible, and you're going to need certain colors of runes in order to deal damage to the dragon. The dragon has multiple layers of armor that will require one or more runes to be spent in order to deal damage. This is where the next action becomes very important because you can actually use an action to peek at the bottom of any quest token out on the board. This means that you could look at quest tokens that are maybe a bit farther away from you so that as you're moving towards them to get the runes that you need, you can make sure that you have the resources that you need to fulfill that quest when you actually get to it. To actually use those runes to attack the dragon, you have to get your character all the way to the furthest end of the board so that you're adjacent to the dragon. And then you're gonna be spending those runes, destroying that one layer of armor. But like I said, this is a competitive game. There's only gonna be one winner at the end and all these different actions are different mechanisms for you to score victory points because you're going to be gaining points for completing those quests, damaging the dragon, building buildings, and blocking those fire marbles any way that you can. But the dragon is not going to make it easy for you because after all the players have had their turn, then the dragon is going to get a turn and this is just resolved by drawing a card from the dragon deck and then resolving whichever effects is outlined on that card. This could allow the dragon to boost its defense by adding even more rune tokens to the dragon board, or instead it could cause the dragon to move left or right in order to target the nearest standing wall. You can also attack the village directly, and you're going to be tracking that on the separate track here, and every time the dragon does five points of damage this way, it's going to be instantly destroying one of those walls. Like I said before, the dragon can also prepare to attack, and the way that this works is that you're going to be moving marbles from the left-hand side of the board onto the right-hand side of the board into that ready position, and there are two sizes of marbles, with one being smaller and one being larger. And this brings me to the final action of the dragon, which is to breathe fire, and any time that that happens, you're going to be taking all the marbles that are in the ready position and then dropping them into that dragon smallest to largest and then letting them fly into the village in order to see what kind of destruction it can do. 
It's going to be destroying any walls or buildings that it's able to push out of their space. But then if the marble makes it to the end of the board where the city is, it's also going to have the opportunity to stop rolling in one of the recessed spaces, essentially giving that dragon a special ability. This could allow it to perform any one of those actions for free or even do something a little bit different. A really cool thing that the players can actually do to defend the city from the dragon is to strategically place their miniatures in a position that they think will help block those marbles. Because if a marble hits it's a player, it's actually going to be gaining some victory points to that player because they managed to help keep that fire away from the city. And I gotta say, there's not many cooler things than deflecting fire. But not every player needs to be this heroic because any one player is allowed to betray the village and join their forces with the dragon. In order to do this, you first need to gain enough victory points to move past one of these red sections on the scoreboard. And then at that point, you do have the decision to join forces with the dragon, and that's going to be giving you a hand of dragon cards and essentially allowing you to play on the dragon's turn. The way this works is that when it's the dragon's turn, instead of the dragon drawing a card randomly, you actually get to choose one from your hand, adding a strategic element, allowing you to decide which one you think will cause the most damage. Of course, you also get to ride on top of the dragon as well to indicate your control over it. And if you're able to destroy the city while being in control of the dragon, then you are the player that wins, regardless of the victory points that the other players were able to scramble together. And the reason that there's three different red spaces out on the board is because if you do decide to join the dragon, you're going to be getting more cards into your hand to choose from the further along you are across those red spaces. Really fun looking game here, and I'm definitely interested in this one myself. And if you think this one looks like a lot of fun as well, you can definitely go ahead and check it out. And I will have it linked in the description down below. Also launching on the 16th, we have Yonder, and this one looks like a really fun competitive worker placement game that has a lot of unique aspects to it. What's really interesting about this game is that the workers actually operate more like a resource rather than your traditional workers in a worker placement game. And what I mean by that is that rather than just having a set amount of workers that you'll be using throughout the entirety of the game, Instead, you're going to be gaining and losing workers throughout the game depending on the decisions that you make. Because there's going to be a bunch of different worker locations, and if you put one of your workers out to one of the locations out on the main board, you actually lose that worker permanently. Luckily, this game is also a tableau builder, and as you build your tableau, you're going to be creating new worker placement locations where you can also put your worker, and anytime you do that, you're actually going to be getting that worker back at the end of the round. You can also place your workers over on other players' tableaus if they have an action that you really want to use. Use, but the catch here is that they're going to be able to keep that worker at the end of the round instead of you. But on a turn, you're going to be placing those workers in order to gain resources, gain cards, or pay resources to add those cards to your tableau, or even just deliver those resources in order to earn gold or other resources. Gaining gold is your main objective because it will be worth victory points at the end of the game. But the excitement with the workers doesn't end with everything that I've just told you because you also have a few different worker types. Each worker is going to have some sort of specialty associated with them that might allow them to visit locations where there already is another worker, or they might grant you a discount for actions that come with a cost, or they might even give you a multiplier on resources that you're gaining. Any workers that remain with you at the end of the round you're also going to have to feed and each worker is going to be eating different amounts and different types of food depending on the type of worker they are. And the way that you get new workers is that at the end of the round each player is going to be drafting one of these boats from the top of the board. This will get you the workers on that boat but each boat also does come with a special ability you'll be able to bring that into your supply and gain that ability for the rest of the game. The game continues like this over a number of rounds and then the player with the most victory points at the end wins the game. And if you are interested in this one, definitely check it out. I will have it linked in the description down below. And also launching on the 16th, we have Jim Henson's Labyrinth, the board game, the 40th anniversary collection. This is going to be offering you the original game, but with upgraded components, miniatures, revised rules, and a brand new expansion. Not only that, but it will also include three additional games as part of the collection with the Jim Henson's Labyrinth adventure game, the card game, and then Ready, Steady, Worm. I'm not going to go into how all those individual games play, but I will let you know how the original played. And I'll just be using pictures from the existing version, but just keep in mind that these will be upgraded with the new campaign. This is a cooperative game where players are going to be playing as four different characters, each with their own one-time use ability card, as well as three different stats known as their speed, their wit, and their brawn. And each of these stats are going to be represented by a different type of die. Players are also going to be starting with a certain amount of willpower, which does double as your health. And if you ever get drained completely to zero, then you're going to be reset out to a particular region out on the board. 
Each of these stats will have a different use throughout the game, but since each player has a different die associated with each of them, some characters are going to be more proficient at certain actions than others. Your speed die is used for movement, and you're going to be rolling that to determine how many spaces you move out on the board. And if you land on a space with a card, then you're going to be resolving that card. The different cards will usually present players with different options or tests where they're going to have to make use of their other stats. And a success will gain you some sort of benefit, but a failure will cause you to lose willpower. But this game does also have a push your luck element where you could spend one of your willpower in order to try again. But of course, if you fail, you could lose even more willpower. A neat aspect of this game is the way that the cooperation works, because when you're on a space with another player, you can actually ask them to join you in your action. And during the movement portion of that action, you're actually going to be rolling the die of the slowest character. But then when it comes to resolving one of those cards, you're going to be rolling both of your die of that particular skill in order to try and complete the skill check that that card presents. You're going to be taking the result of the higher die, so even though this does result in you moving slower, it is a nice way to hedge your bets. But the other action you can take on your turn is rather than moving and resolving a card is that you can just choose to rest and this will allow you to replenish some of your willpower. The players will be continually moving around the board with some of the locations having different special effects that could slow you down in different ways. But as you get through those different cards and complete those checks, you're eventually going to get to a card that will open up a new area of the map. This is going to present some different objectives and goals that players are going to have to achieve in order to complete that area. And if you're able to complete all of those, then players will have won the game. The catch here is that the clock advances by one hour at the end of each round. And if that clock ever reaches the end, then the players lose the game. So you do want to try and be efficient with your actions. But if you do want to check this one out, I will have it linked down below. Also launching on the 16th, we have Luthier, and this is coming from the same creators that brought you the game Distilled, but in this game you're going to be building and repairing instruments out of bone, wood, and metal. Each player is going to have their own personal workbench where they're going to be tracking their instrument cards, their materials, and the different patron cards that they're trying to fulfill. Each patron may have certain types of instruments that they want either built or repaired, and they might even require some scores of music as well. At the start of each round, players can add or remove any instrument cards from their workbench depending on what they want to work on for that round, and then players are going to be taking turns placing their worker tokens out on the various locations out on the main board. You are allowed to place more than one of your tokens at a single location, but it's only the first one that you place there that's going to be contributing its initiative value, and then the other tokens are just going to be adding one to that value for each additional token that you placed. After all the tokens have been placed, they're going to be revealed, and then the player with the highest value at each location gets to take that action first. Each of the locations do offer two options that you can choose from. You can either take a certain amount of a particular type of resource that that location offers, or you can choose one of the cards that are available there. The different cards you can gain are the patron cards that you're trying to fulfill, and then there are the performance cards, the instrument cards, and the repair cards that you're going to be using to fulfill those patrons. In addition to those different resource types that you're going to be using as materials to build and repair instruments, you can also gain money as well as inspiration tokens or apprentices that can help you in a variety of different ways. In addition to this, each location does grant you with a bonus if your initiative value is high enough. Whenever you gain a patron card, it's going to be going into one of the open locations out on your board, but each of these patrons are going to want a number of performances, instruments built, or instruments repaired in order to fulfill their requirements. Not only that, there's going to be a token located underneath that patron, and this indicates their patience wearing thin the longer that you take to fulfill their orders. Luckily, each time this does move forward, it does grant you with the associated bonus located above the token on their card, and also anytime you're able to fulfill even one of the requirements, it's going to be resetting that token back to its starting position, so this can buy you some time. In order to fulfill a performance requirement, you're going to have to take the performance action and then choose one of the cards at that location that match the type of performance that that patron wants. Each of these cards offer an increasing amount of bonuses depending on the quality of performance that you're able to create, and the way that you determine that is by rolling two dice, and then adding the value of those dice onto the initiative that you already have at that location. Each row on the card is going to be associated with a range of initiative, and whichever you end up falling into is going to be the rewards that you get. If you have any inspiration tokens, you can also spend those at this time in order to increase the quality even more. 
In order to fulfill an instrument or repair action, you're going to have to go to the associated action location and gain an instrument card or a repair card of the appropriate type. Then you'll just have to pay the resources required for that repair or that instrument in order to fulfill that requirement. The difference between the repairs and the instruments is that instruments can be built over multiple turns, whereas the repairs need to be done instantly when you gain that card. This means that you do need to have the resources when you pick up that repair card in order to fulfill it, but luckily the inspiration tokens do also act as a wild resource. But for all these different types of actions that you can take out on the main board, if you do it well enough, you can actually move up the performance track, granting you with different abilities to make those associated actions easier on a future turn. Not only that, but you'll also be able to take one of your tokens and place it onto the orchestra board matching one of the locations associated with the action that you just fulfilled. This creates some area control because whichever player was there first or whichever player has the most influence at that location is going to be earning the most victory points from it at the end of the game. But there is a special token when you build an instrument that if you put it there, it's going to be trumping every other token there, no matter how many influence tokens a player has placed there. And when you do fully complete a patron card, you do get a really nice bonus because you'll be able to slide that card behind your board, granting you with either a special ability for the rest of the game or some sort of scoring objective for extra victory points at the end of the game. And when players do reach the end of the game, you're going to be adding up your victory points based on your control on the orchestra board, any of your completed secret or shared objectives, and then any victory points you gain from your remaining resources, and then the most victory points wins the game. And if you are interested, check this one out. I will have it linked in the description down below. Also launched on the 16th, we have a really interesting game, and this one is called Sprocket Forge. And what makes this one a little bit more unique than a lot of other games out on the market is because it does use a mechanism that I don't see in very many games, and that's the use of rotating gears, because players are going to be using these gears as part of their magical factory in order to generate mana, because each player is going to be playing as a different factory with their own unique ability. And you're going to be using your actions to enchant these gears by adding or swapping boards into the face of the gear, and even adding upgrades into the center. Something else that I really like about this game is that every time a player takes an action, everyone else at the table gets a smaller action. When it's your turn, you have three different actions that you can choose from. There is the produce action, which allows you to produce anything at the bottom section of each of your gears. This can allow you to do all sorts of different things like generating mana of all sorts of different types, drawing order cards or cleaning your machine, or even gaining favor cards, which essentially act as hidden points. But there is another action that does make use of them. Like I said, you're going to be activating the icon in the bottom space of each of your gears, but if you also manage to get a bonus token into the center of your gear, you'll also be able to activate that if the outline of that icon is also touching the bottom. One caveat when you do take the produce action is that your factory will also produce a certain amount of waste, and you're going to be keeping track of this in the top right section of your board. And this is going to come into play with the petition action, because if you take that action, there's actually a bunch of different houses offered in this game that can grant players with different special abilities or effects. And you can reveal one of your favorite cards in order to petition to one of those houses in order to gain their special ability. But the thing about these houses is that none of them really like pollution. So in order to gain that ability, your exhaust needs to be below a certain threshold. And as I said, the favorite cards do act as hidden victory points at the end of the game. But if you choose to petition with one, you're going to be revealing the victory points that it grants but then also getting a special ability out of it. Of course, in order to manage that, you can always take the plan action, which allows you to remove two vented mana, and it also does allow you to take three order cards. Like I mentioned before, whenever you take an action, everyone else at the table also gets a smaller action, and when you take the produce action, all the other players can choose between gaining a mana of any type or rotating their gears. When you take the plan action, players can either draw a random order or remove one vented mana or rotate their gears. And finally, with the petition action, players can also discard one favor to petition to the same house, but they only get the points for this and not the special ability. And I should mention that when you do do this, you do get a little bit more points when your card is revealed. But if they can't or don't want to do that, they can also just choose to rotate their gears. But once you've performed your action, you can complete any number of order cards by spending the mana in order to fulfill those orders. And then you can rotate your gears one sector and then store or vent all your leftover mana. The game continues like this over a series of rounds and the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. And if you are interested to check this one out, you can find it in the description down below.
Also launching on the 16th, we have Valiant Wars, A Call to Arms, and this one is a competitive deck building push your luck game where each and every round there's going to be some sort of building revealed. And then each building is going to have some sort of modifier for that round, but it's also going to grant players with a certain amount of victory points for the player that is able to win that card. In order to do that, you're going to be trying to get the most amount of swords for that round by drawing cards from your deck. You'll be able to draw as many cards as you like, and these cards can grant you those swords you need, or they could grant you with an amount of gold, or even some sort of special action or ability. Players are all going to be simultaneously revealing one card at a time, and then the player with the most swords at the end is going to be the one that gains that location card, but then all the players can spend any of the gold that they revealed in order to buy new cards, and you do have to spend the gold immediately because it doesn't transfer over rounds. But when you are revealing your cards, each player does have these dark omen cards in their deck and if you ever get two of those revealed then you bust and you don't get any of your swords contributed to that round and you also don't get any of your gold. And although the goal of this game is to win these location cards and it's the player with the most victory points at the end of the game that wins, each of them does come at a cost because any one of these that you gain is also going to be put into your deck and anytime that those are drawn they're going to have some sort of negative consequences usually subtracting from the amount of swords that you have revealed. But this new version is a standalone expansion that can be mixed with the original game. It's going to add all new champions and locations, as well as mercenaries that can be hired instead of your regular soldier cards. But the catch with these is that they can change sides mid-game. I love Push Your Luck, and I think this one does look like a ton of fun. So if you are interested in it, definitely check it out, and I will have it linked down below. And that's everything I have for you this week, but don't leave yet because we've still got a few awesome giveaways to announce, and these are the easiest giveaways to enter ever. All you gotta do is leave a comment down below, and the first one we have is for a pledge for the new All Play campaign, which is just a company that keeps amazing me again and again. I feel like they just do everything at this point. But this campaign's for the new rolling edition of their board game bag, as well as an artist illustrated playmat. And they have a few high profile artists doing the artwork for these mats. We have Sandra Tang, Quan Chai Moria, Devin Ru, and Ian O'Toole. Their board game bags are really nice and of really high quality. And these new ones are going to have wheels on them that allow you to roll them around like your luggage at an airport, which honestly is really nice because a lot of us do travel with our games and go to different conventions, which do require us to go to airports. So it's pretty much made for that sort of job. And then it's also really nice to have with you at those conventions because if you're taking games with you to play or if you're purchasing games, you won't have to carry the bag around on your back. You can just roll it around with you conveniently. The different play mats all look fantastic and it's no surprise with all of these really excellent artists. They all did a fantastic job. Quan Chai Moria is one of my favorites. I have some of his artwork right down here, which I don't think you can see. He actually created that Galaxy Trucker poster that I should have on my wall. But this giveaway is going to be for one of those bags and one of those play mats, and I'm really excited for whoever wins this one. And all you got to do is leave a comment down below. You can say anything that you want, but if you're looking for something in particular, maybe you could let us know one of your favorite artists in or out of the board game community. And it has been a couple weeks since we ran any giveaways over on the Discord, so I think this is a great opportunity for that because we've got three more and I'm going to run these all over on the Discord. And I really recommend that you do check it out because entering giveaways on the Discord does grant you with really great odds. You can have three different games to win with just one click and entering in on these giveaways is just as easy, if not easier, than leaving a comment on these videos because all you got to do is visit the Discord linked in the description down below head over to the giveaways channel and click the little emoji underneath that giveaway. And this will be automatically drawn at the end of the week. I have all the notifications turned off on our Discord by default, which means that you're not going to get spammed by joining it and it doesn't lock you into anything, but you can still opt into notifications. Like if you want to get notified anytime I create one of these giveaways, all you got to do is head over to the roles and click the little present underneath that post there. But the first giveaway is going to be for Outbreak the Zombie Apocalypse board game. And this one looks like a really fun little zombie game where players are working cooperatively to fight back against hordes of zombies that are coming in from the perimeter of the board. But each of these zombie hordes are represented by a particular tile that each have a different effect and possibly a different way that players will have to defeat them. And as those zombie hordes move over other tiles out on the board, they're going to be overrunning those areas 
and creating the space that you have to work in a little bit smaller. When you defeat any of the hordes, more will take their place in the following round, so players do have to be efficient with their actions and make sure that they're getting and delivering the right types of resources to the right location so that one of the players at that location can use those resources to defeat the zombies that are adjacent to them. Once you've defeated enough of those hordes, you're going to be eventually going up against the final boss, and if the players are able to defeat that boss before the zombies reach their headquarters, then the players win the game. This giveaway is going to get you a copy of the game, and like I said, all you got to do to enter is check out the Discord in the description below, and then click the little emoji underneath that giveaway. And the next giveaway we have is for a Pledge for Fantasy Tavern Brawl, which looks like a really fun card dexterity game, where each game you're going to be playing with different sets of cards, with each of them having different effects and requirements in the way that you can play them out on the board. Most of these requirements will have you throwing, dropping, or sliding the card into play, and some of the actions will allow you to put your colored meeple into the tavern that you're building. Your meeples are going to be how you're scoring points in the game, so of course you want to keep as many of yours in while knocking out your opponents. This giveaway is going to get you a copy of the game, and just like the previous one, just head over to the giveaways channel in order to enter in that giveaway. And the last giveaway we have is for a pledge for Fantasy Mapmaker, which looks like a really fun roll and write, because each round you're going to be rolling two dice, and then every player is going to be choosing one of those dice in order to activate a region on their player sheet, and then the other die you're going to be taking the value and assigning it to one of the terrain types within that region in order to multiply the amount that you get to use that terrain in your map according to its placement requirements. Each type of feature, whether it's a mountain, a forest, a river, a town, or even some type of unique landmark, they're all going to work a little bit differently and have different requirements with how they can be drawn out on your map. Each player is going to have their own set of objectives that they're going to be trying to fulfill, which is going to influence the way that you draw your map. And anytime that doubles are drawn, you're going to be drawing unique event cards that will add a little bit of spice to your map. This giveaway is going to be for the all-in pledge that gets you everything offered in this game as well as the additional map packs. And this campaign is offered as a print and play, so everything will be provided in a PDF form. Once again, head to the Discord and click the little emoji underneath the giveaway. Good luck in the giveaways, but now let's go ahead and draw the winner from last week's giveaway. And this was for a pledge for Zoo Tycoon the board game along with the new Shores expansion. And I draw a winner, I use this application here with all these extra names being bonus entries for my subscribers over on Ko-fi. If you like this sort of content and you want to support my efforts here, this is really the best way to do it. I don't take payment from publishers and I don't require any copies of games in order to do my coverage so this is really what helps me remain independent and it really does make a big difference allowing me to offer you this coverage each and every week because youtube really only gives me like 10 or 15 dollars each week for these videos which take me probably about 10 or 15 hours to make not complaining maybe a little but it is just the way it is but let's go ahead and draw those comments draw those comments Draw those comments, perfect, and draw a winner. And the winner of Zoo Tycoon is Realm, who is a subscriber over on Kofi, and I believe that they were also a subscriber on Patreon before I moved over to Kofi. And I'm also pretty sure that they've never won a giveaway, so this one's been a long time coming. Happy to see you win a pledge, and I'll just reach out to you and let you know that you won this pledge. But if you do see this before I reach out, feel free to email me at adam at shelfclutter.com. And for everyone on YouTube that's leaving comments, I do want to let you know that I do appreciate it. And I do want to see more YouTube comments get drawn. The system that I'm using to do all this did make a lot of sense when I originally set it up years ago. But now drawing a YouTube comment, I think, is about a 10% or maybe 15% chance. I do also really appreciate everyone on the Kofi and the support that they've given me and their involvement in the channel and the community. So I do think offering them a little bonus does make sense. But I was thinking about this recently. I think there is a way that I can shift the scales a little bit. So I'm going to ask the members on Kofi what they think is fair, but I also want to ask you as well if you do have an opinion on this. And my question is, what percentage or ratio do you think is a fair amount for YouTube comments to win versus the additional entries on Kofi? If you have any reasoning or logic that kind of backs that up, I'm also really interested to hear that. I don't know if there's any stats majors out there watching this, but any good ideas, I'm really interested to hear. But that's everything I got for you this week. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full.
Oh.